And welcome in to PressBox Live. I'm Stan the Fan Charles from PressBox and PressBoxOnline.com. I'm with my co-host Ross Grimsley, the old left-hander. And joining us is somebody who knows that jersey behind Ross Grimsley's <laughs> left shoulder, the Montreal Expos former general manager and the former general manager of the Boston Red Sox, and most recently our Baltimore Orioles in Baltimore. That's Dan Duquette. Dan, it's good to see your face. How have you been doing and making out during this pandemic? Hey, good to see you guys. Hi, Ross. How are you? Hey, hey doing great. Good. Um, well, we've been making it like everybody else, you know, a lot of time at home, not too many trips, but our family's healthy and we're, we're grateful for that. I was so glad the baseball season finally got to get going. It, it yeah. was kind of rough the first, first half of the summer, you know, but uh, second half of the summer has been much better with baseball. I thought I'd start there. We got a lot of questions and we want to give you your props on some good things happening with the Baltimore Orioles that point at your direction. But I do want to ask you, how do you think baseball has managed their their entrance into the season and how they've m maneuvered through what are very difficult circumstances? Well, I think they've done pretty well. I mean, it's a real tough mandate to uh, operate in this environment. You know, it's, uh, it's uncharted territory. And given the circumstances, uh, we're getting to the end of the season. We got a bunch of teams in contention and they're, they're ready to start the playoffs. But I mean, I think you got to give them credit for going to work and putting on a show. You know, the show must go on, right? Baseball's uh, <laughs> entertainment. And, um, you know, they travel from city to city, just like the circus. And the show is going on. And, you, we're, you know, we're seeing the very best players that Major League Baseball has to offer. And I know it's challenging, but I got to give them a lot of credit. The, the uh, guidelines and yeah. what's, what's required to keep people healthy yeah. uh, in this environment is just a, a monumental task. And for clubs to do that, in addition to being away from their families for large chunks of time, um, and just being in the team, uh, I, I, I got to give the people that work in baseball a lot of credit for trying to do the best they can in, in trying conditions. So let me ask you one more about this, and that is with the, the way the season unfolded, it made it easier to get th through some different things. We're going to have eight teams from the American League, eight from the National League make the playoffs. We've got a designated hitter in the National League this year. And we also have this extra inning rule, which shocked the hell out of me that I actually <laughs> like it. I find it makes the extra innings actually really interesting. I'm wondering what you think of those situations and those changes. Well, I, I like the extra innings. Uh, if I was a pitcher, yeah. I, I, w I, I, I wouldn't really like it. <laughs> no. I, rem I remember one year they were – uh, my son was trying out for uh, his high school baseball team and he was a pitcher and they started the count two and one on the batter. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what, what are you doing? You're setting up my son to fail. Right. Well, you know, it, I, I'd feel the same way about the extra inning rule because the, the guy starts on second base and now I got a chance to get, I got a chance to get, get the loss, but I do like the drama that it creates and the finality to the game in the Israel baseball league. We tried a home run derby at the end of nine innings for both teams to decide who won that night's game. Now, that, now that's entertainment for the fans, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Each, each team got to pick one batter, and they could have their own batting practice pitcher throw to their batter, and whoever hit the most home runs out between those two guys that squared off ended up winning the game. So everybody was on their feet watching it intently, because they knew it was going to end just like the shootout ends the hockey game. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah, e exactly. It's like, right. boom, we got a finality <laughs> yeah. after th after three hours or three and a half hours. I got to believe the fans are ready to go. <laughs> I got to believe the players are ready to go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and I know the umpires have had enough because they don't get paid by the hour. Right. So I, I, I kind of like, I kind of like it. I kind of, I, I, I like the drama that it creates and I like the way that, uh, the ending comes. You know. I, I left one of those other changes out. This this was passed anyway without the pandemic, but the three batter rule for relief pitchers coming in, 
How do you think that's worked, Dan? Well, I, I think it's helped a little bit. Um, what, what we really need is a little bit more pitch in depth yeah. to, to, to move the games along. Um, yeah, I, I think that's helped a little bit. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of it uh, either way. <laughs> I, I do like to see the games condensed, the action condensed, and I, I think it's a step in that direction. Ross, go ahead. You got a yeah. couple. Hey, Dan, I know you were you were in Montreal, small small market team, Baltimore, medium market, Boston, a big market. Can you tell us a little bit, tell our viewers uh, about the challenges you have in each uh, each different uh, market? Well, the, the uh, Montreal was pretty interesting, and. Um, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why it, uh, it was interesting to me because I went there to learn how to uh, run a farm system. I had been the scouting director for Harry Dalton in uh, Milwaukee. And Harry said, uh, you need to go and be a farm director and learn how to put together teams. And so I took that job in Montreal to learn how to run a farm system. And in Montreal, the farm system is the only game in town. Okay. You're not going to sign free agents. We didn't, we, we had a exchange rate, which took 25 cents off every dollar we brought in yeah. and, and added it to the other side of the equation. So the only way that we were going to have a competitive team was to have a good farm system. So we put our time, money, attention, energy into the farm system, and we developed a good one. So along the way, I learned what it takes to have a good farm system. And I learned how to supplement the major league team with what we had in the farm system. And I, I think that's the most important thing that I learned in, in Montreal. The challenges of being in a foreign country. Uh, well, I mean, I, I was born, I'm a French Canadian. I was born in yeah. the States. <laughs> I say foreign country. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, Quebec, probably, is, Quebec is a country and a country. Not, yeah, one, not one that interferes with our elections. <laughs> <laughs> But but anyway, um, you know, going there, there was there were some adjustments to make, and right. there are there are for the players. But I, I got to yeah. tell you, the blacks and the Latins they love Montreal. Okay, yeah. they, they they love everything about the city, uh, the vibe of the city, and, and right. they, they absolutely love playing there. Um, but that that was a little bit of adjustment, and then getting the families comfortable within a different culture because right. the French Canadian culture. Let, let's face it, uh, uh, Montreal is a very cosmopolitan city, but uh, if you've been there from the States and you're not familiar with the language, it's like going to Europe. Yep. So one of the big challenges there was getting the players and their families comfortable, and John McHale uh, had laid the groundwork. Right. He knew how to get that done, and uh, he, he told me about how to do that when I got there. Yeah, uh, but the, you know that 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 was a big challenge in 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 Montreal. There's other cha every every city sure. has has its challenges, but right, um, you know Montreal's got a few more than some of the others. Yeah. Well, the the other thing, you know, the going to the I mean, you had success in Montreal, you had success in Boston, uh, with the Orioles. I mean, you first got here, you got the Orioles back in the winning ways. Uh, 2017, they were 10 games under 500. Uh, 2018, a disaster. Did you have any indication in spring training, uh, beginning of the season, that things weren't going to go very well? Well, 2018 was a tough year, but we had a lot of good talent on that club. Right. Yeah. We, we, we had some good talent on that club. Our pitching didn't show any consistency, and I think that, that was the big problem with that club. Uh, we thought that we could contend after we went out and signed uh, some more pitching in the spring, and that that didn't happen. We had some injuries, and the uh, you know the the club didn't play well. So that's when we had to uh, break down that right. contending group, and which we did late in the season, and then get going. But going into 2018, you look at that team on paper after we signed some uh, veteran players. Uh, shoot, we still had Machado and Britain. Right. Uh, Gosman, um, you know, um, o O'Day was hurt, but we, we had some good talent on that yeah. club. And the, uh, the inconsistency of the pitching is, is what cratered that, that, that team and, and that year. And that, that's when we had to switch gears and, right. and uh, go, in, go in another direction to, to rebuild the ball club. And um, the, the Orioles right now, 
uh, like every club in baseball right now, are having a season in which development is very different than it's been with minor league baseball. What do you think the long-term effect, and when I say long-term, I'm not asking 15, 20 years down the road, the next couple of years, how will this lost minor league season affect the development of young players? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question, Stan. And I think that, you know, the end result is going to have to play out a little bit. It, it remains to be seen. You have all these players that have missed their uh, developmental time. Um, you know, the, I mean, I, I, I listen to Gary Kendall and he says, you know, we go to work, we take batting practice, you know, we play these pickup games. You know, I, I don't know that that's a great way to <laughs> develop players. Um, and, you know, the long-term viability of the minor leagues has really been stressed with, with, with the pandemic. Yeah. So how that's going to look um, between now and when, when – we have a, a cure and we get back to what we th thought was normal before the pandemic. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about the minor leagues and the structure of the minor leagues. Yeah. Now player development, uh, the, the best way for players to develop is to play right to do their job. And they effectively haven't been able to do their job in a, in a system or in a way uh, that would really enhance their capability to do their job. So, I think the restructuring of the minor leagues across the industry is imminent. MLB has already started the process, uh, but I have some real long-term concerns about the viability of minor league baseball. It's certainly going to change from what we know of it. Is that a job, Dan, that you'd be interested in at this point in your life if you were asked to be some <laughs> type of consultant or liaison <laughs> between the major leagues and the minor leagues, because it does seem like they need somebody that is sensitive to both the needs of both sides. Yeah, well, that's a good point. I, 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 um, I, I have a great affinity for the minor leagues. I know and, you do. and I understand the value of the minor leagues. And, and I was an owner of a minor league club when I was away from running a major league team. So uh, I also own a summer college league team. So I, I have a lot of experience in that vertical, if you will. Yeah. And I, I'd, I'd, and I'd love to see baseball in the communities. I, I'll give you a little example. <clears throat> when I was a, with the Red Sox, we had a team in the New York Penn league and they were trying to bring a ball club to Lowell, Massachusetts. Senator Paul Songus was trying to build or rebuild the city of Lowell around right. bringing in, professional teams and building facilities in their downtown area to bring some vibrancy to a mill town community mm -hmm. that had lost a lot of their economic clout and balance. And we work with them closely to bring that team to Lowell from the New York Penn from in the New York Penn league. We built a new stadium with the help of the Massachusetts gov government. We opened the stadium with governor Bill Weld and that team sold out every single ticket to every single game for 14 years. Wow. Okay. And now they're talking about contracting the city of Lowell. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's just a dramatic turnaround. It's, 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 it's a beloved team because it's the Red Sox. It's close to the city of Boston. It's a big hit with fans, kids, parents, grandparents, like everybody. Right. Yeah. Uh, as as uh, witnessed by everybody going to buy every ticket for 15 years and now they're not going to have baseball there. Right. Uh, I, 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 I just don't think that's the right thing. Correct. Now, uh, that's a dramatic example, yep. but that's on the table and, and that's a potential reality uh, for baseball going forward. And well, right. I guess the answer me, is, that, is that, if you were if you were asked, you would love that kind of job to be working between the two sides? Uh, well, I, I went to the winter meeting and um, I met with the president of the National Association. So I understand uh, what they were trying to accomplish in, in their negotiations to get their okay. player development contracts extended. I've worked closely with Major League Baseball and the people in Major League Baseball. So I, I, I have an idea of, of where they want to take it. 
I, I think baseball means so much to these communities. It's so much a part of the fabric right. of the of these communities and the culture within the states. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think that's the right thing for Major League Baseball to retract all these town, all these ball clubs, and all these towns. Because where do the fans connect and first right. start watching and and loving baseball yeah. and loving baseball? Where, yeah. where do you learn that? When you yeah. go to the minor league ballpark, right? When exactly. you're a kid, that that's where I learned. Yeah. I used I used to go to the games of the Pittsfield Red Sox. I saw George Scott play at Wakona yeah. Park. <laughs> he he won the Triple Crown. And then a year later, we went to see him at Fenway Park against the Orioles. And, you know, we loved it. We, we, but, but we got to follow him as a farmhand of the Red Sox in Pittsfield. I mean, and then we went to see him at Fenway, right? We, we made the trek, right? We, we went to Valhalla. Yeah. We, 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 That's uh, a great story. That's oh, a great story. But, but, that happened, I, yeah. I, but I, I'm not alone in that, in right. that love or affinity for baseball. I mean, I... I you know, I, I used to go to the ballpark. I remember when I dived for and got my first foul ball coming out of Wakona Park. I dived, I beat three or four kids out of it, and uh, I picked it up, and I was so proud. I showed my grandmother, I showed my grandfather, <laughs> I brought it to school. And it's like, heck, you know, I mean, that, that, that's baseball, and that, that, right. that's, a, that's a community. I just think it's part of America, and I, I think it helps recruit fans for Major League Baseball. And, and absolutely right. I mean, you, you see – yeah, you know, some of these towns in Idaho, and that's the closest they're going to get uh, to seeing baseball because, I mean, they have to go to a thousand miles or more to see uh, big league baseball. But that was my biggest goal was to be a minor league player. That's all I wanted because my dad was a minor league player. But uh, going to the minor league games and stuff was just a, it, it's a, a very exciting. It was a lot of fun. You got to see a lot of guys that made it to the big leagues. So that was, that was pretty good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I could tell you just about all the guys that came through Pittsfield and made the big leagues sure. from the time when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, speaking of Idaho, I had a team in the Pioneer League with the Brewers in Helena, and I used to love to go out there. And That's then, the capital, right? Is that yep, the capital city yep, of Idaho? Yep. 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 I, I used to go there, and the, the guy that ran the club used to take me fishing in the mornings in the Snake River. Oh, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so we'd go out there, and we'd go fishing, and then – a couple of years later, we needed a farm club in Montreal, but we didn't need a full farm club. And Pocatello was trying to get into the uh, Pioneer League. And I said, all right, well, I got, I got enough players for half a team. I went and got the Dodgers, I think, and they put yeah. in the other half. And then we put a team out in Pocatello, Idaho. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you didn't know the Pioneer League, you didn't know – that Pocatello, Idaho, yeah, right, right. was one of the cities that you could, you could go to. What was their nickname, Pocatello? I, I don't remember. Okay, all right. I, I don't all remember, right. but we, 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 we had a, half a team in there for – I think John Shelby was our manager. Um, no kidding. Yeah, we, we had half a team in there yeah. for two years. Boss guy at Ross. Yeah. Hey, Dan, I know you've got a background in scouting. Uh, you're scouting director, player development. Uh, you know, with in this day and age, they're getting rid of scouts right and left. They got rid of a, a bunch of them just recently, the last month or so. Uh, you know, how how is it different now uh, evaluating players, scouting players, than it was five years ago? What, what What's the big difference now? I, mean, I know analytics is, but, you know, not having scouts, that's got to be a, a, a problem right there, I would think. Well... I think the clubs are relying more and more on the devices that you can use to measure player skills as part of the evaluation process, you know, as part of the pre-employment screening, if you will, or the scouting, right? So as clubs rely more and more on the data to help inform their decisions, there's, there's less people that are required um, you know, I, I mean, you, you just you, you pick up your phone here, right? You you can go to the game, use your phone, right? Get the video you need, and then upload it to five or six people in your organization, and they can take a look at them. Yeah. Now they're they're not going to see the things that you'll see being right there on the site, and they're not going to go meet the parents or, or, you know, shake shake the players' hands and and look them in the eye, and see if you know and see if he wants to be a ball player, but yeah. but they can see him. All, all you got to do is, is, is take the video. 
And then they have the uh, technology that can tell you what their pitches do, how much they spin, how fast they are, how much they move, and then put it all into a nice little equation to see where they are in relation to everybody else. Uh, same thing with the hitters, you know, how, how, right. fast, how fast is their bat speed? How often do they square it up? When they do square it up, what kind of velocity do they generate? So there's more and more precise uh, modeling to evaluate. And, you know, baseball isn't alone. I mean, the technology took the jobs in several other industries. Right. Uh, so I, I don't know. I don't know when those jobs are going to come back. There's certainly a place in baseball for scouts that can evaluate talent and can project that talent uh, to play in the big leagues. Because right. there's a pretty pretty fair gap in a, a, uh, a sizable number of years between the time that you sign and get to the big leagues. You know, I mean. LK line is rare. Right. The player, the player that went from Johnny's yeah. in, in Baltimore <laughs> to the big leagues. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, how, how many, how many, how many are there? Right. Um, Speaking but, of Al K line, we had the misfortune uh, within the last 10 days, 14 days, we lost two great hall of famers. Your thoughts on Tom Seaver and Lou Brock. Well, t uh, Tom Seaver, um, was a terrific pitcher. I, I didn't know him until late in his career. But uh, Nellie Burbrink, who was a, my cross-check in the Midwest for the Brewers, was the director of scouting and the director of player development for the New York Mets. And his poster child for his administration was, was Tom Seaver. And he was very, very proud of Tom Seaver. And he told us all about it. And I've got Tom's book upstairs, Tom Seaver on Pitching. The Art it's of a, Pitching. It's yep. a great book. It's a I great book, it. man. I got, you got the it? book. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, 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 you know, it's you know a beauty. You know who co-wrote that with him, Ross, is Lee Lowenfish. Oh, who, really? Who, who called yeah, you. Yeah. He, he co-wrote yeah. the book with Tom Seaver. Right. Oh, yeah. oh, really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. A great book. It, it's yeah. a great book. If you want to be a big league pitcher, yep. he, he gives you a step-by-step -step guideline yeah. for all yeah. the things that, great you, guy. that you have to know. Great guy. So anyway, and, and Lou Brock, I, I just got a picture uh, sent to me from um, the girl that used to run community relations for the Expos, Claudine Cook. And she sent me a picture of Lou Brock, who was at the 93 Expos, uh, I guess it was the 25th anniversary. And it was our kickoff dinner. And the year before, we had hired Lou Brock because we had a couple of pretty good young prospects that we wanted to work with them directly, namely Delano DeShields, Marcus Grissom, and Canadian Hall of Famer Larry Walker. Yeah. So, so Lou came into spring training, <laughs> and he worked base running and base stealing with our, with our top prospects. And there was a picture of Lou at that dinner giving out the base stealing award to Marcus Grissom that year. And That's and great. I, I really appreciated what Lou did coming in there to – work with the Expos as a special instructor. He, he, he did that as a, uh, he did it as a consultant, but he really did it as a favor to me. And I always appreciated that, but what, what a great career he had. Well, and, unbelievable. And, and uh, gentlemen and, too. What, what a great guy. I mean, he yeah, treated you know, everybody. You know, in Baltimore, we always tend to say that the Cincinnati Reds made the worst trade in the history of baseball trading Frank Robinson. I don't know that Ernie Brolio for Lou Brock isn't about the equal of that, you know. Well, my my, bu my buddy Bing Devine made that trade. That, Did he think, really? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that uh, he picked he picked his pocket. Yeah. Who was who was the GM on the other side for the Cubs? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I I know Bing made that trade. Hey, I wanted to ask you. I've been wanting to ask you for a long time. Are you familiar with Ken Nigro's? The, the fall something that he wrote when he was a writer for the Sun Papers, the fallacy of the predestined play, and oh, if we had only you know if he, he hadn't uh, been picked off first base, we would have won that game because this would have happened. Anyway, I want to use that fallacy of the predestined play. Would you have been the same general manager in Baltimore, Dan, had you not lost ten years in the middle of your career? Do you think there's anything 
I, I, I didn't lose any years, Stan. I didn't, I, 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 I didn't lose any years. I just, I just wasn't working for a major league team then. Okay. But, you All know, right. Kenny, Kenny Nigro called me last week. Yeah. He called me twice last week because we did that um, uh, documentary on Mark Belanger. Uh -huh. and, it, and, right. it was fi and it was finally on MLB Network. Yep. We've been trying to get him to get it on MLB Network. And my buddy, Mike Ryan, worked very hard to get it on there. So Kenny uh, Nigro called me and he said, uh, oh, my God. He goes, you guys did such a great job. I, I didn't get a chance to see it, but I talked to Dan Shaughnessy. And yeah. he told me about how dynamic the, the, uh, the, thing, the, the uh, documentary the was, 45 minutes. Yeah. yeah. So Kenny then starts – quizzing me on what I know about Mark Belanger. Well, I, I knew Mark Belanger at eight years old. I used to deliver. He was from, his, he was from Pittsfield, wasn't yeah, he? Or? Yeah, I used yeah. to deliver his newspaper on Sunday uh, to, to, to he and his wife. And so he goes, do you know the one pitcher that Mark Belanger could hit in the big leagues, even though he had a batting average lifetime or whatever? <laughs> yeah, right. A bucket of change. So do you know no who, one, you who, know no who one is? Ryan. It's exactly, Nolan Ryan. Yeah. Nolan Ryan. Yeah. yeah. No, no, Nolan Ryan. But Kenny, Kenny uh, was quizzing me on that. But anyway. So uh, getting back to the question, would, though, would, would I have would I have been a different general manager if yeah. I had worked? Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you this. When I was um, when I left the Red Sox, uh, it was it was time for a change. I had been doing that uh, for um, seven or eight years, and the. Um, uh, you know, it, it was time for it was time for a change. So I needed to do something else and recharge my batteries, which I did. And then I was able to come back to the Orioles. I got an opportunity. Um, I didn't forget how to run a ball club or build a farm system or develop a scouting staff um, or how to find good people to staff my team. Um, but I did learn a number of things while I was away that I could be better at. And I, I tried to improve the skills that um, I needed to improve on uh, individually, right, as a person and, yeah. as, and as an executive. So when I came back, I believe I was a better executive in Baltimore than I was in Boston because I used the, the uh, experience I had in Boston as a learning experience. And, and I, I, I learned a lot about um, – myself individually and things that I could do better the next time around. Now, the reason I asked the question, there are two players in Baltimore, recent Baltimore baseball history. It's Dylan Bundy, who you didn't draft, but you did draft Kevin Gosman. And I just wondered if you look back and wonder if both of those guys, and I know, the, I know Dylan Bundy's contract forced the issue a little bit. If both of them were rushed in some way, that had it been 10 years earlier, you might not have done that. That was my real reason for asking that. Oh, as far, well, see, at the, remember at the start, I told you, I wish there were more good pitchers to go around. Yeah. Well, obviously there aren't. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and you, you, you need to have the, the guys that have the talent in the big leagues. I think we could have done a much better job in terms of player development. Because that's, the, that's my question. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I, I think we could have done a much better job in terms of player development because you see all these players that, that left the Oriole organization and went on and did well with other organizations, particularly a lot of the pitchers that we had. And then those two top picks you're talking about, Bundy and Gosman, the organization thought a lot of them, right? They, they, wouldn't, no have question drafted, they wouldn't have drafted them number one. But, but the question is, why couldn't we develop them to get the results in Baltimore that they're getting with those other teams, right? Yeah. So I think we could have done a much, much better job on player development. I'm talking about in the whole organization, not just in the minor leagues. Yeah. But when you get to the big leagues, of course, player development continues. And we, we could have done a better job in the big leagues too. Ross? Hey, Dan, do you still have the sports academy going? Uh, we still have the sports academy, but it's not a it's not a going concern. We, we couldn't. Yeah. We couldn't. Uh, we couldn't run the tournaments there this year or, right. or the uh, summer camp. So uh, we're in the process of, of uh, selling that. Uh, but for, you know, for 18 years, we ran tournaments there, right. youth, youth baseball tournaments and, and summer camps, uh, summer sports camps. And, uh, you know, I just decided it was time to do something else. Yeah. My, my brother still lives across the street, beautiful right. place on the lake. 
No, we just but it's, it's, it's not it's not run anymore. We, we ran the New England Collegiate Baseball League team there. Yeah. One summer, and um, that that was a lot of fun. But uh, we're we're not doing that anymore. Yeah. I I guess the big question now is, uh, are you looking to get back in, and when well, is it going to be? Yeah, I, I don't know when it's going to be. Uh, I love baseball. Uh, you yeah. know, spend spend my livelihood, and I'd like another opportunity to uh, lead an organization. If if that doesn't materialize, I got plenty of things I can do. I'm doing right. management. I'm doing management consulting. I've got some good clients. Some are in baseball. Some are in other areas of sports, and some are in businesses. Uh, but I've got a young family, and right. um, I'm, I'm, I need to keep working. <laughs> I, I understand that. Hey, Dan, I got. I know. I know. About two weeks ago, you had to have somehow been glued to a massive TV to watch the major league debut of the first, first of all, somebody you acquired, but secondly, it was the first Israeli citizen, even though he's a dual citizen, born in the U.S., but you had to be fascinated with Dean Kramer's advancement and uh, talk a little bit about how proud you must be of him. Well, I, I like Dean Kramer, obviously, because we, we traded for him, but I got a chance to see him pitch last year in the fall league and, and he, and he looked good. Um, he looked good out there and he came up and he looked even better when he came up in the big leagues. He had a little bit more life on his fastball, good breaking stuff. Looked like he'd come up with another pitch, a cutter. And, and this, this kid is a smart cookie, man. Yeah, he, is. He, he knows what he's doing. He understands pitching. He understands himself. He knows all the little things that he has to do to, uh, to uh, win a game. And, and, uh, the only question I have, Stan, is, is he good enough for that Team Israel in the World Baseball Classic? <laughs> I, I'm wondering about that. I think he's, I think he's really uh, improved his stock, and I know Adam Gladstone's going to try and steal him from the Orioles. Yeah, I'm not sure the Orioles are going to let him go, but, but uh, he's a good candidate for the rotation. Hey, so, so I want to give you – this is the point in the show. I want to give you some real props and let you talk about it. Uh, Ryan Mountcastle – Keegan Aiken, Dean Kramer are three guys that you brought into the organization. Anthony Santander was a Rule 5 pickup from you. And somebody who I scratched my head, I said, I don't want to see what the season is Renato Nunez guy. But a year and a half later, I'm willing to say that Dan made a nice choice there. Are you kind of proud of some of the players you bought, you brought into the organization? that now look like they may have important parts on this team's future. Bill and Tate, for example, too. Yeah, well, I think we left them a pretty good core. Um, you know, when, when we had to uh, rebuild the ball club, uh, my belief is that, you know, it's like um, uh, you don't renovate the house. You tear it down, you build it up. And so when it was time to uh, trade a number of those veteran players, well, they, they, all, they all got traded at the same time. And, I think, it, you know, it's fair to the fans to signal, okay, we're going to change direction, right? We're, we're not going to, we're not going to tread water. Uh, we're going to go and we're going to swim in this direction. And I, I, I think that was the right thing to do for the Orioles at the time. And, you know, we, we gave them a pretty good solid foundation. The, the just, just signing players domestically yep. and not signing them on the international market. That's like going into a fight with one hand tied behind your back. <laughs> no right. question about okay. it. And that was not your choice. It, 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 exactly. So yeah. I think overall our uh, development program did pretty well with those guys th that you named. And it's like the Orioles farm system, uh, they say it's a, it's, a, it's a middling farm system. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Um, what's his name? Dean Kramer was the 10th best prospect, according to the experts. Yeah. And what did he come up and do? He, he won his first three games in the big league, and like, like no pitcher has in the Orioles in a long time. And then Keegan Aiken's supposed to be the 15th best prospect, according to the ex experts. Right. And what, what did he come up, what, what did yeah. he come up and do? Uh, he, he, he struck he, out he, six Yankees in a row. Yeah. And, and he got his first win. Okay. And then uh, the other kid, John Means, that was a kid we took in the 11th round. I left him out. Yep. Yeah, didn't he, mean to. He, he, he's done well. Uh, Mike Yastrzemski's had a great year. He's had an unbelievable year. So uh, we left a pretty good foundation for the Orioles. And you're starting to see the fruits of the uh, scouts that, that identified the talent. Uh, uh, Matt and Danny Haas did, did great work 
for me when I was there, and they signed a lot of these players. They're, they're very proud of Mountcastle. Yeah, because yeah. Mountcastle's got the hands to be a big-time hitter. Yeah. He's, he, he's, he can do a few things with the bat that not a lot of right. players in the big leagues can do. I very mean, impressive. He, very you, impressive. You see him turn around that, uh, that inside pitch. Um, my, my buddy who just passed away, Gary Hughes, the scouting director, yeah. with the uh, Expos when I was there, I was sitting with Gary in a game in spring training, and uh, the only player he asked me about in the entire field was, was Ryan, Mountcastle. Ryan Mountcastle. Yeah. Wow. Ryan, Ryan Mountcastle. That was a couple of years ago. But anyway, th- these guys are going to be good. And there's some other ones coming along. Uh, this kid, Grayson Rodriguez, is as good a pitcher that the Orioles have had in their minor league system since Mike Mussina. He's got some serious, serious talent. I mean, that's, that's who you yeah. – not compare him exactly to, but that's the kind of talent he has. Well, yeah, he's got he's got that kind of talent. He's a bigger and more physical kid yeah. than than uh, Mike was, and of course he'll have to show that he can be durable and withstand the uh, pitching in the big leagues. But that's the kind of stuff and the kind of control uh, that he could have. But uh, you know, I, I was proud of the work that that we did and our scouts um, and our our player development people. And you, you'll be able to see the foundation. Uh, well, you saw it this year. I mean. Yep. San- Santander was among the top RBI guys in the league. Um, and he's just 25 years old. I mean, the Orioles have got a bright future. They've got one of the younger teams in the big leagues. I think they got the third youngest team in the right. big leagues. Uh, and, and the, you know, they, 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 they have some more on the way. So I, I've always said uh, one of the ways that you can evaluate an executive is how his company does after he leaves. Yeah. And I'm happy to say that, uh, you know, each place that I left, uh, they, they did pretty well when I left. I mean, yeah. the Expos yeah. had the 94 <laughs> season when yeah, I left. Right. The Red Sox run the World Series in 2004. I mean, the Orioles didn't do that. Uh, but we left them, you know, we, 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 we left some groceries in the cupboard. No, um, you definitely did. And, and Mike is kind enough, like you were when you took over for Andy, to say that Andy had left you some talent. Mike is very gracious when he talks about the talent that they had there. And he's reaping some of the benefits of your organization, you know, your regime's hard work, Dan. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and Mike's working hard to do a good job for the yep. club. He, 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 he's, he's put his shoulder to the wheel. Let me uh, ask you, let me ask you. player development and then also do a good job in the draft uh, with the team picking high. Let me just ask you a couple of questions. I shied away from talking about the relationship with Peter and all that. Obviously, Dan Duquette knew that it was a smart move to to get Latin players into the organization. Was that just something you met resistance from from day one, and it never became that important? Well, that was just that was just the philosophy, of the ownership. Yeah. Um, w- when I was with the Expos, we had to go out and sign players from the international markets. You know, we 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 signed Javi Vasquez. And Jose Vitro, uh, Holbert Cabrera, uh, Vladimir Guerrero, uh, Annabelle Sanchez is still still, still pitching. pitching. We, we yeah. signed him with the Red Sox, uh, you know, and they and they brought me to Boston to develop the international recruiting network. We went outside players in Korea, uh, Tomo Oka from Japan, Sun Woo Kim, Annabelle Sanchez, Hanley Ramirez. So, I mean, that, that's one of my core competencies. Yeah. And that was a big disappointment for me when I got to Baltimore. I, I thought that we'd be able to uh, convince the ownership of the merits of going out and signing players on the international. Well, and um, which you did market. initially. Initially you did with, um, with uh, Chen. We signed know. Chen, yeah. right. But that was, from, that was from a pro. Right. That was from a pro market, and that, that was a good signing for us. Yeah, we got a left-handed signing. pitcher that helped stabilize the club. But, hey, uh, but that, that, that was a big disappointment because, you know, the, the farm system, you need, to, you need to do some things pretty well uh, in a couple different areas. But the one area that you've got to really do well is in the farm system. Yeah. And I don't know how a team can compete with just the talent that's in the U.S. There's not, there's not enough players to, to right. staff the teams with just the players from the U.S. I mean, you look, look at where your star players are coming from. 40% of them are coming from international markets. 
before, before I let Ross ask you a couple and then we'll let you go, I do, you mentioned your core, well, you mentioned as a core competencies. And one of the other core competencies I think Van Duquette has as good as anybody in the game is value, knowing the value of players. Having said that, I've always believed, and I, I don't sit in in the meetings with you and Peter and Buck or anybody, but I don't think Dan Duquette would have wanted really to sign Chris Davis to that length and dollar value. I don't think Mark Trumbo would have been signed by Dan Duquette at those dollars for that length of time and Darren O'Day. I'm just asking for a one-word answer. Am I right on those? Well, no, there's no argument here from what you said, Stan. <laughs> All right. Uh, um, and, but, and do you feel that you could have used that two, nearly $200 million, $250 million better uh, had you had that at your disposal? Well, I mean, of, of course, because if you're going to put uh, resources into your player development system, if you're going to put resources into your international recruiting it's less risky and yeah. you, 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 you get a better return. You get a more yeah. significant return for your team and your fan base. Um, I mean, that's in the book. Okay. Yeah. The teams that do that and, and do it well. Uh, and you, you, have seen one of them. They just got done playing there at Camden yards. Yeah. Um, they have a lot to show for it. They have yeah. their own system. They have their organization. Brilliantly uh, they, run. Yeah. They, yeah. They, they and, and they're efficient. Yeah. And, I mean, if if you take a, if you talk to John Sherholz, right, who's in the Hall of Fame, and if you read Branch Rickey's book, they'll tell you the same thing. Okay, the heart and guts and the soul of a major league team is right in its player development operations, right in its farm teams, and any team that wants to be good over the long haul has to be good in player development. They, they right. they've got they got to have a good farm system. I'll let Ross ask yeah. you a couple more, and then we'll let you get out of yeah. here. We've yeah. really appreciated your time. Yeah, Dan. Uh, two two quick questions. Um, one thing, with, as far as the minor leagues go, obviously a lot of players missed out this year. Is, is there going to be an instructional league, or is that uh, uh, that you know of, or even an Arizona Fall League? Well, they're they're trying to figure out the structure. Uh, I believe that Major League Baseball has approved the winter instructional league programs. And I know the uh, people in the Oriole front office would like to have a winter instructional league program, and I'm sure they need one. Yeah. They're just waiting for the resources to be approved by the ownership group. And the, um, the Major League Baseball, they're going to end up having some kind of forum for their best prospects. I mean, it's in their interest to do that. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't seen exactly what it's going to be. But I would think that this year, if you could, make that Arizona Fall League a little bit longer, that would, that would benefit all the clubs. Because, right. I mean, the Arizona right. Fall League is a who's who of uh, the players coming up to the big league. Yeah. Ross, last what's question, your last one? Yeah. Last question. I, you know, you being in Montreal, spending time up there, and I was up there a couple of, like, a year or so ago, you know, trying to promote them, getting a the team. Uh, what are the chances, and would you go there? <laughs> well, I, I, first of all, I, I love Montreal. Two of our boys were born in Montreal, yeah. D Daniel and Dana. And, uh, it, you know, it's a great town. It's a, it's a terrific market. Uh, there's still a lot of challenges. There's a few hurdles to get baseball back there. Right. Um, but, you know, it's a good market. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's a good market. I, I think the, um, you know, if you take into account the, the TV market, um, I mean, I, I went skiing there last year, Ross. So yeah, I, I, I definitely go back. There. All right. <laughs> I, well, I feel, I feel yeah, pretty, I, I feel pretty confident that baseball, because of how much money the sport has lost with the pandemic, that it is will speed up expansion because the teams are going to be worth about a billion, billion two, billion three. I, I think we're going to get two new teams in the next three, three, four years. Yeah, well, that's good. I, yeah. I like your thinking. I hope we do. Less, I, less, I don't, I less don't know where the less players are. pitching. Where's the <laughs> pitching going to come from? I don't know where the players are going to come from, but I like your thinking. <laughs> All right. Hey, Dan, um, we really appreciate your time. A real quick prediction. Out of this crazy season, we're getting to the playoffs. I know you got to distill it down to 16 teams. Who's going to play for the World Series this year? Well, I've been following the Dodgers. They look pretty good. 
And the the other team that's a serious contender, yeah, and has some serious talent is the White Sox. Right. I don't I don't know if they got the pitching, yeah, but they got they, they got some serious players on that team. That the kid in center field looks like a cross between Willie Mays and Frank Robinson. That, that he's he looks that good. We haven't oh, seen him man. yet this year. Yeah, man, okay. that, that that kid's good. They got Anderson, the shortstop. They got Mankata. They got the RBI guy at first base. They got a good catcher. And they're the organization that traded Fernando Tatis to San Diego, correct? Yeah, yeah. For James Shields in the big James game, Shields deal. Big game, James. Yeah. I, I'm sure they wish they had him back. I bet they, I bet they do. Dan Duquette, yeah. really appreciate your joining us. So, so you like the White Sox versus the Dodgers possible? Yeah, that's possible. You know, that, hey, that kid Manny Machado's having a good year this year, huh? <laughs> yeah, he's, 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 he's an MVP <laughs> candidate. I was yeah. watching him the other night. He looks pretty good, too. Yeah. I, I think he decided to pick it up and tell Tatis, you know, that he was the, he was the big he's man, the man on campus he's still. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh. He's Thanks, been our Dan. guest tonight. We really appreciate the time of Dan Duquette, former All general right. manager lot, of the Orioles, the Red Sox, the Expos, and a friend. Thank you, Dan Duquette. For Thanks, Wallace Dan. Grimsley, yeah, thanks, I'm Ross. Stan the Fan Charles from Press Box, and we'll see you down the road pretty shortly. All right. See you guys. Enjoyed it.